Are you happy? All right, I think it's going, yes. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be doing module 34, uh, looking at health and happiness. So this is the final module for Psych 101. So woohoo, you made it. Um, hopefully you have at least, that's why you're probably still watching this. So uh, so yeah, health and happiness, it's it's the wrap up to the, the stress and illness side of things. Um, kind of the answer to all the issues that we were looking at in the last module. So as always, listen for the four random facts. Um, also, don't forget to uh, take the quizzes, both for the lecture as well as for the chapter or module. Uh, and message me if you have any questions, all that kind of good stuff. So otherwise, let's go ahead and get rolling. Slide two, health and happiness part one, coping with stress. So there's a little bit of recap here at the beginning, um, kind of re-examining what we looked at in module uh, 33. Um, but yeah, these are these are some different things that we might be doing. So coping with stress. Uh, coping, oh, by the way, you can find the module starts on page 395. I can't remember if I said that or not. I have an ADHD day. But anyway, uh, coping with stress. Coping, alleviating stress using emotional, cognitive, or behavioral methods. Um, essentially, this is like, so you're, you're feeling stressed. These are all the potential things that you might choose to do in order to deal with that given stress, to reduce the, the negative effects of it. Um, so maybe maybe you're feeling uh, overwhelmed, which is making you feel anxious or irritable or sad or whatever. Um, so you might you might look at like kind of examining that and kind of figure out ways that you can adjust your emotional state. Um, you might utilize cognitive uh, tricks and things such as you know, picturing yourself in a in a relaxed place, or sitting, or like meditating for a minute, or something like that, taking a breath intentionally. Um, and behavioral methods might be you you get up and do something um, to make yourself feel better, right? Juggling or or, or playing music or uh, just removing yourself from the. Maybe you're like sitting here doing whole school work, and you're like, oh my gosh, I just can't do this right now. Get up and get a drink of water or something. All those things would be technically coping mechanisms. Um, to help you deal with those things. So problem focus coping, there's gonna be a couple different ways of, of, of dealing with stress um, and coping with these. So problem focus coping is gonna be attempting to alleviate the stress directly. Maybe you're stressed out because you've got a paper due, right? This is the last module, so there's something coming up. Um, so you, 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 you get it done, so that way you can just don't have to worry about it anymore, okay? Um, by changing the stressor or the way we interact with that stressor is gonna be the thing here. So that would be something, right? You, you, if you get it done, it's no longer a stressor. Um, maybe you have a relationship that is causing a lot of stress for you. Uh, so maybe you need to look at like how can you can can you kind of like change up that that uh, that relationship as far as like how uh, how can you reduce maybe the negative effects of the individual or something like that on yourself. Um, you know, even even exploring the idea because I mean, in all honesty, we can't change the person, but we can change how we how we interact with that person. Um, and so if maybe it's a boss or a, or a coworker or something that's causing you issues. Um, you can't change the stressor in this case, right? The person is there and they're, you got to work with them. Um, but you can change how and when and how often maybe you interact with them. Okay. So this is changing your environment to some extent and or your actions with the environment. Uh, if your house is a mess, you like, you feel stressed by that. So cleaning your house and that you've, you've changed your environment to where it doesn't stress you out anymore. Uh, emotion focused coping is going to be attempting to alleviate stress by avoiding or ignoring a stressor and by attending to emotional needs related to our stress reaction. This is actually usually what we're going to be doing if it's something that's unchangeable, right? Uh, you have a, you have a miserable job. Okay. And it just, it stresses you out. Uh, but you need the paycheck at this point. So, Problem focus might be you start looking for a new job, but in the meantime, you could you just kind of you're like I'm just going to do it, get it done, go for you know just get grind it out, um, but then kind of figure out what can I do to 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 reduce the negative effects of this environment on myself or uh, of this you know situation on myself, um, and depending on the thing, there's going to be lots of different possibilities of what you choose to do to help you cope. Um, we're going to look at some of those here in a second. Okay, so slide three, health and happiness part two, coping with stress. So perceived loss of control is generally going to be where we start to not cope with stress very well. 
Um, so losing personal control provokes stress hormone output, right? Uh, I mean, essentially, we, we start to read the thing as basically a threat. Generally speaking, a threat is something that you have no control over, which is why it's threatening, right? A dog coming at you or a bear coming out of the brush at you or something like that. You have no control over that thing in the environment. Because we lose control, we feel stressed and we get ready for taking action. Um, so rising stress hormone levels related to blood pressure increase and immune response decrease. We talked about all that in module 33, right? Um, and this is something that, that can basically be, be, be taught to us. This is something that we learn. So you have the learned helplessness can be like we have an uncontrollable bad event, right? You couldn't help it. It wasn't your fault to some extent, right? Um, then we perceive that there's a lack of control in the given event, and then which leads to a generalized helpless behavior. What is interesting with this is a lot of times this can actually be self-induced. Okay, I'm trying to think of if there's a better word for that, but we, we essentially can bring this upon ourselves. Example, let's say, uh, let's say you have a job. Okay, I don't know if you do or not, but let's say you got a job and let's say you got a project that the boss gave you. The boss is like, I want you to get this thing done. You got a week to get her done. Okay, it's plenty of time. Well, you get home and you're like, I'm gonna start working on it as soon as I you know, get, get time to do it. And you're like, so you got, it's, it's gonna be above and beyond what's normally for work, um, but it's, it's gonna be part of it. You go home, and, or maybe it's a paper, whatever. Anyway, you get home, and you're like, all right, I'm going to work on it. And you start working on it, and then after just a little bit, you're like, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm just not feeling it. I'm just not motivated to do this right now. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to wait till tomorrow, and I can work on it tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow rolls around. Day goes on. You're, you're, you, you just, for whatever reason, you got distracted, and you forget to do it, so you, you miss that day. Next day comes around, you're like, all right, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make up for it, I can work on it now. And you sit down and you start working on it and then yeah, you're just not really into it. So, so you know, like I'll, I'll, I'll put on a YouTube video while I'm, while I'm doing it. And then pretty soon what you're just sitting there watching a YouTube video not working on your project and it's midnight and your time to get go to bed and blah, 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 right? And this continues to happen. Day, the day it's finally due, <clears throat> you're like, it's not ready. You haven't had time to do it, right? Uh, all these other things have come up and put themselves in place. And then the boss explodes at you and it makes you feel like, oh, you know, there's, I just, I don't know why. I, 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 you know, I just didn't have time. This was unreasonable of my boss. Um, you know, I wish I was as smart as my, my sibling. If I, if I, if, you know, if my brother was smarter, like if I was smart like them, you know, like they just, they do everything right, but I never do. And it, it becomes this negative spiral, right? And we begin to feel like life is just happening to us. It's not my fault. Uh, it, it's it's everything else that's causing this to happen to me. Um, and you know, I'm just unlucky. And thus, we lose help. We lose the sense that we can actually control our own, our ourself, our actions, and our environment. Um, and with that loss, we we experience increased stress oftentimes. So. How do we break that pattern? So there's going to be two ways of kind of like dealing with this. One is basically just to recognize it, um, you know, take ownership. But yeah, I could, I have no control over what the boss does, right? I have no control of him like yelling at me and maybe overreacting me like, you know, I should just fire you. I trusted you and blah, 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 right? I, I have no control over that overreaction. But I did have control over my time and I had control over the fact that I could have gotten the project done. Okay. So recognizing what you can take ownership of and what you can do to change it, because that is an unpleasant experience. If you've ever had a boss yell at you, it's no fun. Um, if you've even had just a boss kind of like give you like the like disappointed look, right? Like, I trusted you and you failed me kind of a thing. It's not a fun thing, right? And parents might do this to you or whatever. Um, but, the, uh, but recognizing that we in fact have some control over whether or not that will happen given the fact that we may or may not have control of the thing. Now, if you legitimately were trying your best, right? The boss gave you a giant project. You're like, I need this tomorrow. You're like, you know, I, I, that's just not enough time. Like, I literally do not have enough time to accomplish this. It's going to take me like 20 hours, right? That's one thing. But if you legitimately had a good enough time and everything, that's, you know, that's where you got control. So slide four, health and happiness, part three, coping with stress. Um, locus of control is going to be a big factor here. And this is partly tied into the, um, the, 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 uh, learned helplessness. So we have, there's two potential locus of control. There's external locus of control. This is where chance or outside forces control your fate. You basically don't have any say in it. It just, you know, life is happening. Fatalists, 
people who believe that their their life that there's a set path for them, and no matter what they do, that is the path that they're going to end up on. Um, that is going to be an external locus of control, right? The fates or whatever, the universe, whatever you want to call it, they, it has laid this path for you, and no matter what you do, this is what's going to happen, right? Polytraumatic stress symptoms are going to be here, or post-traumatic stress symptoms are oftentimes going to be here. Um, you'll, you'll oftentimes see people who struggle, right? Like you, you might, you, there's a good chance you know somebody out there, might be you, okay, but you know somebody out there who just, everything goes wrong for them. Right, and they're like, I just can't catch a break. You know, nothing, nothing ever goes right. It doesn't matter what I do, nothing goes wrong. You're like, I might as well just give up. Okay, that's oftentimes going to be a, a sign of a external locus of control. These are people who are not taking ownership of their lives and are 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 basically waiting to be lucky. You know, it's not my fault. I'm unlucky. Well, it kind of is. Right, your 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 choices and your actions and things can actually affect affect you. So. This is the, where you have the flip-flop, internal locus of control. People control their own fate is the idea here. So, doesn't matter what life throws at me. I can, I can handle it and deal with it potentially uh, as long as I make the right choices. So, it puts a lot more power back in my, on my side of things. And it also makes it, uh, it gives me more, more control over my environment and over what happens to me, right? Um, free will, willpower, self-control, all these things are going to be connected to this internal locus of control. I, so if I, if we go back to that boss example, right? External locus of control, I had no control over it. I, you know, I just, I, nothing, nothing aligned for me right. And so therefore, I, this is why I, I failed in making this happen. Internal locus of control, you stop and you're like, you know what? I really could have done better, right? I, I, I could have taken, when I had the time, I could have taken it and I could have done this project. I'm sorry. Um, in the future, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to, to do a better job with time management or something like that, right? Um, if you're not sure what you got, <clears throat> so what, what they found basically is that stress-wise, people with a stronger internal locus of control typically will fare better than people who have a, a strong external locus of control. Um, if you get too strong of an internal locus of control, though, it, 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 is, it is possible to have too much of a good thing. Uh, if it's too strong, essentially what you can end up with is you can end up with stress issues because you feel like you should be able to control everything. When in fact, there are some things in the world that are outside of your, your control, right? Um, you know, you, you could be, I mean, I guess technically you could like go back and be like, well, if you just would have done this, then that would have been one thing. But like, you know, you, you, you go to tr town and somebody crashes into your car. Um, you were doing everything right. It was just that person wasn't paying attention and they, you know, they rammed into you. Uh, you could make the argument, yeah, but if you were paying more attention, you could have avoided it. It's possibly true, but you know, there are some times when just things happen, right? Um, and so in those cases, don't beat yourself up over it if it was somebody else's fault. Uh, but do your best, right, at the same time. Um, take what you got as much as possible, figure out what's working and what isn't, and then change it within yourself if it's not. Okay. Random fact number one. The popular witch's brew, ingredients of eye of newt, toe of frog, and wool of bat. You might have heard, like they use that a lot of times in different things. Um, it's actually an archaic term for mustard seed, buttercup, and holly leaves. So um, there you go. The witch's brew is actually just actual plant things rather than random animal bits and pieces. All right. So let's keep on going. Slide five. Health and happiness, part four. Uh, building self-control. So self-control is the ability to control impulses and delay short-term gratification for longer-term rewards. If you ever see little kids, they have no self-control, right? They want this now, and they they don't you know they don't want to wait for it. No matter what, they're going to yell and scream until they get the thing that they want, potentially that they've been trained to do so. But um, as we get older, we begin to develop self-control. Where like, uh, okay, so here's a good example. They they did there's a there's an experiment out there called the marshmallow experiment. Uh, there's a good chance you can find it. Uh, I, maybe I can, let me see if I, do I have it on here? I don't. Okay. Um, I'll have to see if I can find it. The, 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 the marshmallow experiment, essentially they took a bunch of kids they brought them into a laboratory. Um, they set a marshmallow, they set them at a table. They set a marshmallow in front of them. And the researcher says, um, I got to go away for a few minutes. If the marshmallow is still there, when I come back, you can have two marshmallows. Uh, if it's not, then that's the only marshmallow you get. 
basically. Okay. Um, so they, they took these kids and they, they, they studied them. The vast majority of the kids ate the marshmallow before the researcher came back. Um, in some cases, they ate the marshmallow before the researcher even left. Uh, like that, you know, they had no self-control essentially. The few kids that did show self-control and actually made it to the end where they got two marshmallows. Um, it was interesting because the, the study was, was actually to find, uh, what did they do differently? Okay. And then they, they took these kids that took this original, uh, exam. They had a lot of them. There was like 70 or 80 kids that did this experiment and they followed it, followed their life progression for the next 20 years. Um, what they found is that ability to control impulses and delay short-term gratification for longer-term rewards predicts good health, higher income, and better school performance. Okay. Um, so here's the thing. What people, what they're initially, they're like, and there's the research. So if you have good self-control, congratulations. And if you don't, sucks to be you. Um, but that's not what the original researchers were actually trying to find. What they were looking for is how do people with higher self-control think? and process the information that's before them compared to people who have lower self-control. What they found was that the kids who, had, who exhibited higher self-control early in this, in this, these kids are like five years old, right? When they did this experiment, um, they, they had coping mechanisms that essentially allowed them to eliminate the potential of, of giving in, right? So one kid just sat there with their eyes completely closed and they were just picturing themselves stuffing two marshmallows in their mouth as soon as the researcher came back. Um, and he made it and he, that's exactly what he did. As soon as the researcher, he's like, and she's like, here's your second marshmallow. He's like, blah, blah, and stuffs both of them in his mouth. Um, there was a little girl who did a similar thing. She actually hid under the table from the marshmallow until the researcher came back in. Um, some of the kids that ate them were very, like one kid like would start by licking it. Right. But that was one thing that you consistently see is that the kids that didn't make it hyper-focused on the marshmallow, right? Here's the marshmallow and they're just staring at it the whole time. Or like one kid, like I said, they licked it and then they licked it and then pretty soon they nibbled it and then pretty soon the marshmallow was gone. One kid ate the middle out of the marshmallow and then stuck it where it looked like the marshmallow was still there. Uh, that might show some deviance there. But anyway, the uh, what they found was that these kids, they had better they had better mechanisms, basically, better, better tools or better games in place that allowed them to put off the things that they um, didn't want, basically didn't want to. So strengthening self-control, practice, in overcoming unwanted urges, it is possible to get stronger or better at self-control. Um, but just like regular strength, like muscle strength, if you use it too much, it's going to get depleted, right? If, I, if I'm lifting really heavy things over and over again, eventually I'm not going to be able to lift that heavy thing anymore. Um, my muscles are going to give out. Self-control is the same kind of a thing here. What is a better strategy? Um, rather than rather than attempting to strengthen, I mean, you should you should strengthen your self control. That's always a good thing. But rather than than, than working on strengthening your self control, it's better to remove the the uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for. It's better to remove the temptation completely. Um, so they did experiments with adults. Even they had adults come in. They had one group of adults. They set a plate of cookies on the table. They said, "You can't have a cookie, but they're going to be there for you." Okay. Um, but you can't eat one yet. They had, they had them sit there and do it for a few minutes, and then they had them go into a, a room and do some very difficult puzzles. Uh, and then they had another group of adults who came in, they just sat with no temptations, and then they went into the room and did the same puzzles. And they found that the people who had to wait for that cookie, um, with the cookie present but weren't allowed to eat it, gave up on the puzzles much faster than, than the people who, who didn't have to uh, avoid it. So interesting thing with temptations, if it, if it is no longer an option, it ceases to be a temptation, right? If you're on a diet, don't keep a bag of Oreos hidden away just in case. Get rid of them. You know, maybe eat them the day before, but anyway, no. But, uh, but make it where the temptation just isn't there. Then you know, it, it takes zero willpower because it's not an option. I had a friend in college who he was struggling with video game addiction. Um, I use addiction loosely there, but anyway, he... He played way too many video games to the point where it was actually hurting his grades pretty bad. He was playing like eight to 12 hours a day pretty regularly. Um, and so he got this Tupperware thing and they had just come out for, for, for dieting. Which, and I, I thought it was pretty clever that he used it for video games. But it's a Tupperware thing and it had a timer on it. And basically what you do is you, once you put the lid on, it was impossible to get into this Tupperware until the timer went off. And so you'd set it for however long you want it to be. 
And then once the timer goes off, it would open itself and you could access whatever was inside it. Um, and what he did, what he did is he took all of his video game controllers, stuck them in this Tupperware, closed it, and, and set the timer for like 12 hours. So he, he couldn't play video games for 12 hours. And at first he thought it was going to be a terrible. He thought he was going to just be like, you know, hyper focused on the fact that he can't play video games. And what he found was within about 15 to 20 minutes after he did it, he didn't even think about video games. They just totally left his mind. He was able to focus on his schoolwork for the day um, because essentially it wasn't an option and his brain realized it wasn't an option. And so therefore it just kind of shuffled it to the side. It came up every now and then, like he'd be like, oh, I should play video games. Oh, I can't. And then he'd go on and do whatever else he wanted to do. Um, so this, that kind of a thing, right? Remove the temptation, make it to where it's not a possibility. And generally speaking, the, you'll, you'll be able to essentially have immediate uh, self-control improvements due to the fact that it's not a possibility. So there's a tip. You're like, I wish you had told me that at the beginning of the semester, but yeah, anyway. Uh, six, health and happiness, part five, explanatory style, optimism, versus pessimism. Is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? Um, so optimists expect to have more control to cope better with stressful events and to enjoy better health. It's just expected, right? That's part of being an optimist. You see the you see the glass is half full. Um, so you expect things to turn out for the good. Optimists tend to run in fam optimism tends to run in family. So it does seem to be either a genetic trait or something that is learned generation to generation. It, it leans toward genetic though. They found that even in adoption studies, um, people who come from optimistic families tend to be more optimistic themselves. Optimistic students tend to get better grades because they expect to, which is weird. But if you expect to do well, you generally do better. And if you expect to do poorly, you generally do. We, we, we kind of have self-fulfilling prophecies to some extent. Um, optimistic students respond to setbacks with more productive strategies. If they get a bad grade, they go, okay, how can I avoid this in the future? Rather than just be like, well, see, that's what I was expecting. So therefore, you know, no surprise there that I failed the test. Uh, it, that's a big, it's a big difference, right? Instead of going like, okay, I didn't get the grade I wanted. I got a D on this one, right? I remember my very first D I ever got, uh, it was in college. I, I literally had never gotten anything below a B until I was in college. In, on any of my schoolwork, which is crazy, so considering I was ADHD and and had uh, slight dyslexia, but the um, yeah, I was like I was hardcore, wanted to be smart, right? And I fought everything I could. Uh, got to college, I had one class, and the, I got a D on one of my projects, and I was like, what? And I immediately went to the instructor. I was like, why is this a D? Explain it to me so that way I can avoid it in the future, right? I also have a very strong tendency to be very optimistic. I assume that the world is going to happen or is going to go good for me. Um, even like in the moment, I might be like, oh, this is terrible. But I, from my experience, what I found is that generally it, it ends up, I, you know, I land on my feet when it's all said and done. Um, and those are going to be the kinds of strategies you're looking for, right? If you don't get what you want, you don't just go, oh, see, I'm dumb. You you make an effort to, to make it better. Um if you don't, if you don't come by optimism naturally, you can still connect those. Like you can recognize when you maybe are going more pessimistic, um, recognize it, and then stop it. Which sounds silly, right? Have you ever seen that clip? There's a there's an old clip from a thing, and the counselor comes in, and they're like, "It's gonna take five minutes," and she's like, "Okay," and she tells her his problems, and he's like, "Stop it! If you stop it, it'll go away." Kind of a thing, and that's basically what here, right? If you if you recognize it, stop it before it gets rolling. And then be like, what can I do to make this better? Um, you, you can basically artificially make yourself more of an optimist uh, rather than if, if it doesn't come so naturally. So slide seven, health and happiness, part six, social support. Um, feeling liked and encouraged by intimate friends and family is huge. Remember, we, we, Maslow, we, I think we talked, yeah, we talked about Maslow in here before, right? The, the hierarchy of needs. Um, after food and air and water and the basics of survival and, and having that security that you're going to continue to get them, friendship and support is the next most important stage with that, right? Um, they found that across the board, having friends and family that are close to you and that you feel connected with um, and that, that are that are positive, not toxic in your life um, is one of the biggest indicators or, or, or like flags, if you will, that will indicate that you're going to have a ha higher level of happiness and health 
compared to people who don't have those things. So social isolation leads to higher loneliness. Duh, right? But anyway, uh, higher loneliness and risk of death equivalent to smoking. And actually equivalent to smoking about between a pack and a half and two packs a day. So it's not like I smoke a cigarette from time to time. It's like if you're like a chain smoker, basically, um, early, uh, early death is more likely. The risk of early death is more likely or as likely as smoking like that. Um, not to mention, they've also found that it, you, you actually your, your happiness levels will be lower than the smoker generally generally be. So, um, so yeah, not only do you not do you get the you know early death, but you also get the, the risk of of not being as as happy about your life overall. Um, so, finding friends and finding people to connect with is extremely important. If you don't have friends, I know like, you're like, oh great, in post COVID world, like it's impossible to make friends. Uh, if you feel like you don't have any friends. Make an effort, right? Find some clubs or something. You're like, man, I'm an introvert. So, well, you know, if you don't have anybody to, to connect with, you're gonna, you still need it. Even if you're an introvert and a loner, I tend to be an introvert and a little bit of a loner. But I, you know, you, you got to make some effort. Um, so find a club, find find a group that has similar interests. I would, you know, do the juggling thing. I, I I used to go to a group when in college and stuff that we would all just get together and juggle. Or find someone to play music with if you're a musician. Or if you love reading, you know, join a book club. Um, some of them might be boring, but who cares? Like it, it, it lets you connect with people who might have similar interests to you. Um, if you're a knitter, you know, join a, a knitting circle. Um, there's clubs out there for pretty much everything. So it's some find, think of something that you're interested in, and then connect with people who have similar interests to you. And that's an easy way to get friendships started. Uh, then the, then the key then is to make the effort to, to build that friendship and allow it to grow. And that's where your personal effort comes in basically. Okay. Eight health and happiness. Part seven, uh, research based findings about the health benefits of social support. Uh, they found that it calms, and reduces blood pressure and stress hormones. So if, if you have these issues like this, they did an example of, of just like getting a hug from somebody who, who, uh, who you care about. Um, has massive benefits for your overall health because uh, it calms, reduces blood pressure and stress hormones, fosters stronger immune functioning. If you're starting to get sick, uh, having personal touch and things can actually can can reduce the likelihood of that disease taking taking hold of you. Um, provides an opportunity to confide painful feelings. It allows us to process things and, and get it out uh, in the, the open where where it can be can be seen and and kind of dug into and 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 pull apart basically um where it becomes less of an issue right you can kind of, or you might even be able to put it in kind of a new light maybe something feels terrible but then once you get it out you're like and actually that's not as bad as i thought it was kind of a thing um but until you get it out you just sit there and ruminate on it where it just kind of keeps coming up and coming up and coming up and coming up uh it can it can eat away at you and cause cause damage basically emotionally and, and potentially physiologically right our biology uh, struggles with it okay um, uh, so yeah, we need people, even you introverted loner out there, you need people. We need it for in our life. Uh, reducing stress, uh, slide nine, health and happiness, part eight. So what are some of the best ways to reduce stress? Um, let's see, I think there's the research here. Yes. And that's coming up in just a second, but if you want to turn to page 402, you can, you can see the little graph that we're going to be looking at here in just a second. Um, aerobic exercise has, has been found to be one of the best ways to reduce stress. So getting out, getting your heart moving, this could be, you know, walking briskly or jumping rope or, or jogging or um, going for a hike or whatever, just something that makes you move. Uh, swinging a kettlebell, okay. Uh, all those things could be things that, you know, riding a bicycle, all those kind of things, right? You want aerobic exercise where you have sustained oxygen consuming exertion that increases heart and lung fitness. Um, that's the key there. Benefits of exercise, they found that adds uh, adds to quality of life, which is fairly moderate, right? Overall, better health, lower chances of illness, things like that, uh, increases happiness to some extent. Uh, helps fight heart disease and reduce heart attack risk. Doesn't mean it's completely gone, but it, again, it reduces the chances of it. Uh, it's a predictor of life satisfaction. People who exercise regularly generally are more satisfied with life overall. Uh, and it reduces depression and anxiety. Slide 10, this is where the image is that you're gonna also find on page 402. Um, so this was a, a study that was done where uh, they had three different groups. They had a control group, and these are all people who, who were suffering with, with uh, pretty severe depression. 
Um, and they had three different groups. Uh, one group basically had no treatment. They were the control group, and they just wanted to see kind of where they stayed. And they stayed flat, which is what they were expecting. Um, they had one group learn to do uh, meditation and things like that. Um, what they found is that when they went with the meditation and, and, and all that, it, it reduced depression pretty significantly, right? Um, it was actually, it, the, the meditation was on par with people who were taking medication alone. Um, so if you, for some people, if you want to get off like depression meds or things like that, uh, meditation might be something that would work just as well. But by far, the number one group that had the biggest reduction in overall um, depression symptoms was those that they, they had a weekly exercise regime where they were doing it a few times a week. Um, I think it was four times a week, if I remember right. I don't, I don't remember the numbers exactly. But anyway, very quickly they found that the depression levels dropped drastically for those participants, um, much more so than, than any of the other groups in there. So if you, if you are struggling with depression or anxiety, uh, exercise is one of the best things you can do. What's also interesting is when you're when you're in the middle of depression and anxiety, a lot of times exercise is like one of the last things you want to do, but it really is the thing that can help you the most. You know, when you're, if you're struggling with depression, you just want to like climb in bed and pull the blanket over your head. Um, but that's not the, that's not what you need to do. Generally, you, you need to you need to get out and start moving. Um, you're you're looking for levels of dopamine and serotonin to build up, uh, and exercise is one of the best ways to naturally increase the dopamine and serotonin levels. Uh, in your brain, which will reduce the negative effects of depression and anxiety. So if you're ADHD also, exercise inc is incredible. They found that with ADHD, um, one of the issues with it is actually dopamine levels, which is why people with ADHD get bored really easily, like to where it's like painful. Um, so one person's like, this is boring. And the ADHD person is like, you know, spasming over here because it's so uncomfortable. But it has to do with ADHD brain. Typically, the, the, the dopamine levels basically drop faster than an average person. So it's those dopamine levels to, to function at a normal level um, or a relatively normal level. And exercise is going to be one of the best ways you can get that dopamine boost compared and or doing things that are more like fulfilling. You know, unfortunately, a lot of people with ADHD, they end up focusing on like, you know, their phone or something like that. You get a small amount of dopamine boost, but it's not enough to basically fill the hole. So, okay, that's a little side note, little side nugget for you out there if you're ADHD. There you go. Get out and exercise more. It's also why little kids that have ADHD, if they're able to move more, their, their symptoms are going to be significantly lower than people who uh, with ADHD who don't get out and move. Okay. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Random fact number two. Antarctica is the only continent that turtles don't live on. So there you go. It's just too cold. Um, all right. Slide 11. Health and happiness, right, part so health 10. and happiness, uh, part ten, reducing stress, biofeedback. Basically, this is where where you pay attention. They, this could be like official where you go into a hospital or something. They hook you up to all kinds of connections, uh, and they can officially record down like you know where where your maybe muscles are tight or things like that. But it's recording, amplifying, and feeding back information about subtle physiological responses. Right, something happens, and you if you become more self aware. You might start recognizing, you know, like when this happens, I can feel my heart rate accelerate a little bit, or my hands clench, or my jaw clenches, or I get tight in my shoulders, or like so on and so forth. If you recognize this, you can kind of stop and intentionally reduce the tension. Okay. Um, so as you feel it picking up, you can take a breath, right, or something along those lines. Um, they found connected with this relaxation helps to alleviate headaches, uh, hypertension, anxiety, and insomnia. So learning how to, and relaxing isn't the same as just like sitting on the couch watching TV, right? Like that might be kind of relaxing, but it's a, it's actually much more intentional than that. Um, so it helps alleviate headaches, hypertension, anxiety, and insomnia, lowers stress, uh, and it promotes better wound healing. They found people who can learn to basically kind of control their bodies relax themselves deeply um you know this could be like where you like lay on lay on a bed or lay on the floor and start at your feet and be like you know where do i see any or feel any tension in my feet and you work your way up you know from your from your feet you go to your ankles and ankles to your calves calves to your knees knees to your thighs so on and so forth up your body work your way all the way up and through until you get it finally to your head and by that point hopefully you have fully 
relaxed, right? It might take 10, 15 minutes to get there, um, but they found that they'd be, they'd be very beneficial um, and, and helping reduce stress. Okay. Um, because again, stress is a is a response, a biological response to to a psychological state, um, and so that combination, right, where we're, it kind of starts to feed itself. So if you can kind of shut down the psychological state, the body follows. Um, if you look on page four hundred three, you'll see an image of health and happiness, part eleven on 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 slide twelve. It's the same thing. Um, they did a they, they did a study with a bunch of guys who were, were type A personalities, right? That uptight, go getters. Um, they were salesmen, um, and what they found basically is that they they, they took these group and they they were they're at a relatively high, actually significantly high rate of heart attack. And they took a group of these guys who had heart attacks, um, and they and they basically started working with them. Um, so one group, they just did the normal, the normal thing, right? They gave them their, their medications and things to help reduce the, the chances of a second heart attack. Um, another group, they, they did behavior modification training with them where they, they learned to like reduce their heart rate intentionally um, through, through uh, meditation and different things like that, where that biofeedback side of things, right? Uh, what they found were that the patients who had the lifestyle modification also beyond just the, the medications and things like that, um, were significantly less likely to experience a heart attack over the course of the next few years, um, which is a big win, right? Uh, so it went from, they, there was a 6% chance for those who just had the standard treatment, they were down to a 3% chance uh, for those who had the additional training, which is a big one. Like that's a, that's a overall, that's a much, that's better numbers than a lot of times they'd expect to see in most studies. Um, so for a relatively small amount of things, right, kind of teaching them to let go of things and not get angry as easily and things like that, um, they found that it increased the survivability and, and likelihood that they would not experience a second heart attack. Okay. Um, 13, health and happiness, part 12, reducing stress. So meditation reduces suffering, improves awareness, insight, and compassion. So this is one of the best ways to do biofeedback. I used to be a pretty strong meditator. Um, back when I was doing martial arts and stuff, I'd use it before fights and things, but, um, I haven't used it as much lately, which I probably should, but the, the simplest form of this or one of the easiest forms is going to be mindfulness meditation. There's a whole ton of apps out there to help you with this. A lot of them are free. You can get ones that you pay for, like I think Headspace and Calm, for example, there's free versions and paid for versions. Um, but basically what you do, I'm, I'm going to give you the simplified version of this. It, 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 everyone always thinks meditation is this like crazy hard thing to do. It's not, right? At least not this kind of meditation. Now, if you're trying to get like, there's different forms of like contemplation and things like that that are much more challenging. But simple, this is a this is uh, pulled from Zen Buddhism originally, um, this idea. But you just sit and you breathe and you let things happen, Right? So you, you, you sit, you close your eyes or, or, or look in front of you and kind of unfocus your eyes um, and you're going to breathe in deeply. There's actually a, a technique that I, I learned from a guy. He's a, one of my friends growing up, became a Navy SEAL and he, uh, they, they do box breathing. What you do, and it, it basically is a way to, for them to force when you're like in a super stressful situation like Navy SEALs tend to be, um, it's a way of reducing your heart rate and things so you're, you can keep functioning at a much higher level. But you breathe in for four seconds, hold for four seconds. Breathe out for four seconds. Hold for four seconds. Breathe in for four seconds. You sit and do that for about five minutes and it'll actually change up your brain waves. They've done studies on this. It takes at least five minutes though for most people to sit and breathe. You can also do where you like you just breathe in slow. The hold is kind of important. So you're gonna breathe in, say like, let's say you do a seven second breathe or four second breathe in. Hold for four, breathe out for seven, breathe in for four. And do it very intentionally, right? By focusing on the breath, it basically gives you a point where, where your brain might kind of calm down, right? You get a little bit less of that monkey chatter brain. Um, what, they, what they found though is that with that, with those simple things, relaxation and silent attendance to inner space, 
monitored breathing. It's linked with lessened anxiety and depression, as well as improved sleep, interpersonal relationships, and immune system functioning. They've actually done research on people who meditate like more deeply. There's a there's a, a Tibetan monk from France originally, now lives in, in Nepal. I can't think of his name. Anyway, he is a... Uh, he, he's done a lot of research over the years. It's, it's, he, before he became a monk, he was a, a neuroscientist. And he was studying how the brain worked and things like that. Um, and so because of the, now he's become a monk and he's been doing all his meditation for over 20 years, um, he offers a really good test example because they know what his brain looked like before all these years of meditation. And now they can see what his brain looks like now. And there's there's been some significant changes physically within his brain over the past 20 years with meditating. Um, but the interesting is they've also found that even people who he, he'll work with people for like a month. So they'll take people, they'll take a bunch of people who are non meditators, um, do brain scans, have them, have them learn how to meditate, simple meditations, like, like a loving kindness meditation or something like that for like 10 minutes a day. Doesn't need to be a lot. And they do a brain scan a month later and they found that there's already physical changes occurring in the synapses and things within the brain. Um, it is, it has proven to be very, very useful in, in helping people um, deal with a lot of different things. So slide 14, uh, health and happiness part 13, what happens in the brain as mindfulness is practiced? So correlational and experiment, uh, yeah, experimental studies offer three explanations. Mindfulness strengthens connections among regions in our brain. So you actually, uh, there's actually part of the brains where the pathways are gonna increase. There, it, our brain likes to be in this in the state that basically gets, gets put into if you sit and breathe. Okay, you sit in the quiet or in relative quiet, maybe just nature sound or something, and breathe. It does amazing things for you. Uh, mindfulness activates brain regions associated with more reflective awareness. We become more conscious of our bodies in that moment. We also become more conscious of what our brain is doing, what we're thinking about, maybe what thoughts keep coming forward, uh, and allows us to kind of to kind of look at them and and process it more easily. And mindfulness also calms brain activation in emotional situations. So if you learn to, when you start to get uptight, that little breath can basically re-hijack the brain in a positive way and get it going down a less crazy emotional path. Uh, so it really, it really has been proven to be a very useful tool. Um, if you, if for some reason you're like, that just seems too weird, I'm not into like the old Zen thing or like it seems too agey or whatever. Um, they've also found, they found similar things to be the case with like prayer, um, things like that. So if you're a Christian or Muslim or something like that, Jewish, um, then you can also look at utilizing those, you know, just kind of deep prayers. And there's a bunch of apps out there to help with those kinds of things too, like meditative prayer. Um, uh, what are some of the apps out there? There's one that's like the Amen app, I think is a free one. And there's like a Hallow app, um, like Hallow, like Halloween or like Hallow would be thy name. Um. That, that uses that it helps it, it uses similar kind of techniques to the meditation but it's it's it, it's a prayer um instead so those are some some things to maybe look at doing but again it, it basically it just it allows you to kind of come in stop pull things in um slow your body down so okay random fact we're gonna keep going with this but in a second random fact number three uh if your throat tickles scratching your ear can help make it go away. So if you if you find yourself with a, with a that weird like little cough tickle in your ear, going like this with your ear, can make that go away. Um, all right, slide fifteen. Health and happiness part fourteen: faith communities and health. Um, the faith factor. What they found: religious uh, religiously active people tend to live longer than inactive people. Um, women are more religiously active than men, and they typically outlive men. What they've also found is that that men who are more religiously active actually has greater benefit for them than people than than women who are religiously active. So, um, so if you're a dude, you might want to get involved in some kind of a church or something, but or a synagogue or whatever. But what they this they did a study um, and they found that weekly religious attendance, specifically for men, outweighed even people even if they exercised or didn't smoke and things like that. Um, they don't know why. <laughs> This is one of the interesting things with this whole thing. So they've, done, they've been doing, a, they've done a lot of research over the years uh, trying to understand this because they know for a fact people who attend religious things live longer, um, and oftentimes significantly longer, like like five to ten years longer on average. Um, 
And to this day, we don't know why. Like it, it could be the community, it could be the faith in a higher power. Uh, maybe gives more, more or less. Maybe reduces stress where you're like, you know, you kind of have the sense that that things are going to work out in the end because you know a god or something like that has control. Because um, they, they've even studied groups of like atheists who get together regularly. They don't have the same bon benefit of people who go to religious ceremonies, and so it's it's a um, it's a weird thing. Like we 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 just don't really get it. Maybe God blesses them. Who knows? But anyway, the 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 it it has been found to be a very positive. Um, thing. So there's there's some different theories here. If you look on page 406 or on slide 16, um, you'll see some of these. So you have religious involvement. Uh, a lot of times it leads to healthier behaviors. You le less smoking, less drinking, things like that, right? Because um, maybe those things are looked down upon by the community or whatever. Um, social support, faith communities, close relationships, you got them kind of built in. Um, positive emotions, hope, optimism, coherence, so less stress and anxiety. All lead to better health, less immune system suppression, and fewer stress hormones, greater longevity overall. That's the thinking right now. But honestly, when it really comes down to it, these are just possible explanations. We can't figure it out. Just we don't know. We're not sure. Like it, you know, these are these are the most at this point the most logical th thinking, but we really we really don't know. So interesting stuff. All right, happiness part one. Positive psychology, um, Siligman, so, or Seligman. Um, so interestingly, up and through the 1980s, uh, the idea of positive psychology basically was a joke. Uh, we, were, we were really busy studying when, when psychology goes wrong, but nobody was studying what it looks like when psychology goes right. Um, and and uh, Seligman, when he, when he first, in the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, was looking for his PhD, and he wanted to study happiness. Um, and he literally got laughed out of the room at several different universities when he was looking at going for his PhD. Um, by mid 1990s, it was fast becoming the thing, and today it is the fastest growing field of psychology, uh, basically, just flat out. There's there's nothing that competes with it as far as size of classes and numbers of, of, of people going for this this emphasis in the psychology degrees. And so it's the feel good, do good phenomena. Um, and the idea of subjective well-being. Core features are going to be good life that engages one's skills. This is what they found. So all of this research has been done right in this field now to understand like what is that actually makes you happy. Uh, there is a, a really good documentary called Happy. Like that's it. Um, it was made in the early, I think it was like 2011, 2012, somewhere in there. So it's about 10 years old now. Um, but it was looking at the the research and things it's done. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can find it. I know it's on like Hoopla right now, at least as, as of the making of this video. It was on Hoopla for free. Um, might also be on like Netflix and Amazon Prime or things like that. But um, but yeah, I'll track it down, see if I can, and I can uh, I'll share the information with you. I'll I'll at I'll least I'll show you the information for what it is the video is. But um, it's looking at this right, this idea of like what are the things that make you happy. Uh, so good life that engages one skills, meaningful life that extends beyond the self are key features of happiness. So what they did is they like for this documentary, and actually for a lot of the research, they've got all over the, all over the world, and they're like, what is it that makes you happy? Um, some people thought wealth, like you know, the wealthier you are, the happier you are, and to some extent, it's true, right? Um, there's a certain point though where it, once you've hit it, it no longer makes a difference, and generally that point is in America, on average, nationwide, is right around sixty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars. If you make sixty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars a year. Uh, you are about as happy as that money is going to make you because that is where the comfort level is for most people, right? You can, you basically, you reduce the the, the financial burden at that point. Um, you you uh, you can afford the little bit of luxury and things like that, um, but not too much, right? So they found a difference between somebody who makes like seventy thousand a year and somebody who makes a million dollars a year, happiness wise, isn't that much different. Now, the difference between somebody who makes $70,000 a year and somebody who makes like $10,000 a year is a significant difference because the, the strain of not making enough is, you know, puts stress and things on you, which reduces your overall happiness. Um, but yeah, so income isn't necessarily a big thing. But even, even in some cases, they found that a lot of the happiest people are, are poor by, by society standards. Um, but they, it's kind of how they see things, right? And a lot of times you'll find that those people are very deeply connected with, with friends and family and their community. Um, and that's really where happiness derives from. 
So positive traits that focus on exploring and enhancing a wide range of behaviors uh, and positive groups, communities, and cultures are going to be some of the key features for people who are truly happy. Okay, happiness part two. What affects well-being? Uh, emotional ups and downs of days and within days re uh, rebound, right? We are You, you are not going to find people who are just, right? We're ups and downs. That's just part of being human. We have cycles. We have all kinds of different things, right? Um, so what affects our well-being? What they found is uh, the big things that we might think are, are awful affect us significantly less than they would have thought. So they did, a, they did a big giant study on people who won the lottery. And are they happier today than they were when they won the lottery? What they found is that the majority of the people aren't any happier. In fact, in some cases are less happy than before they won the lottery. Okay. There's initially a giant spike in happiness, you know, woohoo, but then it comes back down to your normal. All of a sudden it just becomes life, right? You buy a Ferrari, that Ferrari at first is woohoo, and then pretty soon it's just your car. Uh, about three months, three to six months for most people, if you, you go from up or down. They also did a study on people who became paraplegic, meaning you know, you're you're you've lost use of arms and legs. Seems pretty darn awful. And initially there was a big drop in happiness. But within about three to six months, for most of the participants, um, their happiness levels came back up to where it was before they became paralyzed. Um, so it's it it is these the big events, positive or negative, have less impact on our overall happiness than they would originally have thought. So rebounding from worse events takes longer. Even tragedy is not permanently depressing, though, for most people. Right? You lose your entire family gets killed in an accident or something. Um, it's awful. You, you honestly, I couldn't think of anything that'd make me lower. But studies have shown that for most people, within about a year, you'll be back to your same happiness that you were before the loss. Right now, that you, it's not like you, you're not less like, well, whatever, they're gone. But uh, that's not how it, how it works exactly. But the the thing is that it's uh, you 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 function again, right? You might still feel pain from the loss. But your overall happiness, your day-to-day -day performance, is back where it was before that giant loss. Um, the duration of, om of om uh, emotions is overestimated, right? A lot of people are like, if I get this thing, I will be happy forever. And it, it doesn't really work that way. Um, all of times, our resiliency is underestimated. I'll never recover from this terrible thing. And then we come back up. So either direction, we end up coming back to our normal levels. Okay. That was a long way of saying that, but anyway. Um, 20, happiness part four. Happiness is relative adaptation and comparison. So happiness is relative to our own experience. Um, this is the adaptation level phenomena. Let's say you, great, you, you get a great job. It's a job you absolutely love. It's everything you wanted, right? And they're giving you $70,000 a year. You are stoked. This is better money than you've ever made. Okay, you're, you're, it's just perfect. And you're so happy about it right up until you find out that everyone else who's in this same kind of work gets on average $90,000 a year. Okay. All of a sudden you're like, why am I getting gypped? Right. I can compare myself to other people. I was, I was unbelievably happy with $70,000 a year. It's twice as much as I've ever made or whatever. Right. But, but I feel like I'm getting gypped now because they're getting, they're getting more. There's a Foxtrot cartoon. Um, that's a perfect example of this. There's a, there's a, if, I don't know if y'all have read Foxtrot. It's a family thing. Anyway, comic strip. But there's a little boy, 10 years old, kind of a little nerd, um, in a good way, but you know, computer hacker type of kid. But he, he goes to a gumball machine. He puts his quarter in, he turns the knob and he opens the thing. And he goes, I got two gumballs. Woo. And he starts like celebrating, you know, I got two gumballs. I beat the system, blah, blah, blah. And all this stuff, you know, like, ah, I beat, you know, this is the best day of my life. And then this kid is like, hey, isn't that machine supposed to give you three? And he's like, I got two lousy gumballs. And in the background you hear, woo, I got four gumballs. Okay. Um, so there's that, what you expect and then what you get might, you know, it can it can change how we see it. Um, when I was in grad school, I was, I was sitting at a coffee shop one time. I had scraped together some change. And I was living back east at the time. And I, 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 scraped, I literally had scraped together. I like, you know, went couch diving basically to find some change to get a cup of coffee. Um, went to a coffee shop, was sitting there working on a paper while I was drinking my coffee. And I overheard a conversation between two very well-dressed men. Um, 
And there, the one guy was talking about how he was going through some real financial problems lately, you know, and him and his wife might have to sell one of their houses. And being a psych person, I'm like, you know, real financial problems in selling one of our houses seems like a weird combination. So I started eavesdropping, right, as a good psychology student always does. Um, and it turns out that, that him and his wife, basically, they had been making, they're making over $500,000 a year combined. Over half a million dollars a year combined. But he saw himself as poor. And he had multiple houses and all these different things, right? Uh, he saw himself as poor, though, because he was living in a neighborhood where the average income was well over a million dollars per household. So by the standard that he was comparing himself to, he was poor. Compared to me, the kid, you know, the, the, the college guy that's got literally barely enough money to pay for a cup of coffee, um, he was unbelievably wealthy, right? And honestly, even to this day, like I'm, I'm probably never going to see that kind of money even close to it. Like I'm a teacher and a farmer. Like I, I did not choose career paths for for income, but um, but the uh, but yeah. So that's that's you know it. it and then what's also ironic is then he got up at the end of their conversation. He was all just like, oh, this is terrible. He gets up, goes out and gets in his brand new BMW um, and drives off. I was like, you know, if that's poor, like sign me up, right, kind of a thing. But um, so yeah, compar comparatively, makes a big difference. Happiness is relative to the success of others, which is the relative deprivation, right? Um, so yeah, like it or not, it affects us this way. And you might be aware of it. You're like, oh, I don't want it to do that. But it but it does. You can't help it. Uh, you can recognize it, and it will reduce the, the impact to some extent. But at the same time, you're still going to feel a little bit bummed if you're doing the same work as somebody else, and you know they're making more than you are for exactly the same job. Um, Right, that's a it, it's not a fun, not a fun thing. Uh, Twenty one happiness part five. Yes, so you also you'll find the graph that's here on this slide on page four eleven of the book. It's the happiness is table thirty one or thirty four point one. Um, so researchers have found that happy people tend to have high self esteem in individual country in individualistic individualist countries. So like America, most of Europe. Um, where, where we, we, we pride, our pride ourselves in individualism, right? Our, our, like I see myself as important as myself and not as part of the group. Um, having high self-esteem increases likelihood of happiness. Doesn't matter as much if you're from a, a culture where uh, it's more collectivism. So uh, they tend to be optimistic, uh, outgoing, and agreeable. They have close, positive, and lasting relationships. So you're looking for friendships that are, you know, you've got history together basically. I have work and leisure that engage their skills. And I, I know from experience having jobs that don't engage your skills. It's miserable. But anyway, um, yeah, so you're looking for your opportunities to basically practice what it is that you're truly good at. Uh, have an active religious faith, especially in more religious cultures, although it does, again, it plays a factor no matter where you are. And sleep well and exercise. They have found that happiness does not seem or is not related to the things of age. In fact, this is interesting. I, I might have talked about this already, but they've actually found that there's a U-curve of unhappiness. Um, you're at your very happiest when you're a little kid, or initially, and then you hit puberty and you have a drop in happiness, and then it goes back up until late adolescence, early adulthood, late teens, early 20s, um, at which point it begins to drop, and it continues to drop. And then you're actually at the, we get to our lowest point, and this is a, this is a biological thing. Great apes also have a similar similar unhappiness U curve. Um, we had our bottom point at around 45 to 50, with 48 being the actual mark where most people experience the very lowest that they'll feel. So if you're like in your 30s and you're looking back like, man, I just don't seem like I'm, I'm as happy as I used to be. It's true. Biologically, you're not as happy as you used to be. But if you hang on, or if you're like 40 or whatever, but if you hang on, right? Um, you start going back up, and by your by your early 60s, for most people, early to mid 60s. Uh, you're back to the same happiness level as you were when you're 18. And it continues to go up. Uh, and by the time you're in your 80s, most people are at the same happiness level as when they were small children. That's so cool. But so age isn't age doesn't make you happier, less happy, or whatever necessarily, other than just that biolog biological factor. The older you get and the younger you are, the happier you will be with kind of a in the middle. Um, gender, women are more often depressed than men are, but they're also more often joyful. 
Um, men tend to be a little bit more flatlined emotionally. And physical attractiveness has nothing to do with happiness, right? You could be hideous or drop dead gorgeous. Either way, doesn't matter. You're going to be generally equally happy. Um, that doesn't play as much of a role. Okay. Random fact number four, 79% of pet owners sleep with their pets. 79% of pet owners sleep with their pets. Um, I used to. I don't anymore. But I started, I had a little dog that used to always sleep with me. And I had a cat that slept with me. And then after a while, as I got older, I, 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 I have kids and a wife that sleep with me. And that's good enough. So please. <laughs> Even if I don't want the kids to sleep with me all the time, they, they tend to work their way into our bed by some point by the morning. But anyway, uh, 22, happiness part six. Which suggestions can you provide for a happier life? And what did the text suggest? So this is going to be where I leave you to kind of think about this and ponder it. Um, how can you truly achieve the best happiness possible for you? Um, they gave a whole bunch of suggestions on page 412 there. You know, taking control of your time acting happy. So that's another thing they've actually found that people, if you, you know, we talked about that with the, the emotions, if you force a smile, it makes you happy. Um, so yeah, take a look at that though on page 412, it gives you a whole ton of ideas and um, go from there. So with that, I'm going to leave you be. That is the end of this class as far as all of the different modules and everything. Hopefully you've learned something out of all this. Um, don't forget to do the quizzes for the lecture as well as for the chapter. Uh, message me if you have any questions. And maybe I'll see you in another class. I, I teach other class, site classes at PCC. So uh, if you got something out of it, if you enjoyed it, keep an eye out. I, you know, I might be teaching some other things too. So um, hope you all have a wonderful time. Good luck with everything uh, in your, your academic careers, in life. I hope that you have more happiness than sorrow uh, in your day-to-day but also knowing that you can bounce back and recover from anything, right? Um, so yeah, until I see you again, or if I hopefully will see you again, good luck and uh, have, a, have a wonderful day and a wonderful rest of your life uh, from here on out. We'll see you. Goodbye.